This is Jeff Dice, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. And we are in, I guess, our fourth week, but the third section of the book, we are delving straight through uh, Mises' magnum opus, Human Action. And for those of you who have been listening along, hopefully reading along, uh, we had an introduction with Sean Rittenauer up at Grove City College. Uh, we went through part one, which is all about acting man uh, with our friend D- Dr. David Gordon. We went through part two, which is titled Action Within the Framework of Society with our friend up in Massachusetts, Dr. Bob Murphy. And now we are moving on to part three of the book, Economic Calculation. And now some of you may be sitting home as a result of this coronavirus scare. Some of you may have some extra free time on your hand. And especially a lot of you may be wondering uh, you know, exactly what is going on with the economy, what is going to be the result of not only these, uh, what I would consider illegal and uh, unconstitutional government shutdowns and, and control of movement of people, but also what the Fed is doing, which I consider egregiously wrong and actually immoral in response to this crisis. And, and I think that there were a lot of problems, uh, first and foremost, the amount of debt in the economy that were baked into uh, this latest financial crash, which is, in, 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 from my perspective anyway, merely precipitated by fears of this coronavirus rather than caused by it. And I think a part of our mission here at the Mises Institute is to help people demystify all of this and to understand exactly what's going on with respect to central bank malfeasance. And there's, this is a great time really to be giving yourself a little bit of a mental reprieve from everything going on on social media, everything going on in the world Maybe you've got a little extra free time, as I mentioned. So going through human action is a valuable use of your time. It's going to make you a better, smarter person. Maybe not a happier one, but certainly a better and smarter one. And so all that said, our, our friend and guest this week is Dr. Per Bielund. He is, of course, a professor at Oklahoma State University. He teaches uh, economics and entrepreneurship there. He's the uh, a senior fellow with us at the Mises Institute. He also edits uh, one of our journals, several other journals on his own. And I think in many ways, his two most important contributions, in in a sense, are his articles for Entrepreneurship Magazine, which is really a different kind of animal than most econ professors or academics write for. It's it's aimed at a broad lay audience and, and his insights uh, writing for that in a very different style, I think, are very valuable in terms of making economic concepts more readily available to lay readers. And building on that, he's absolutely outstanding on Twitter. I would consider Pear's Twitter account uh, an absolute must-follow, one of the top three or four econ Twitter sites, no question about it. He's at Pear Bielund, which is P-E-R-B-Y-L-U-N-D. So if you're not following him on Twitter, you need to. Uh, he is absolutely fantastic at creating Twitter threads, which extrapolate on ex- economic concepts, but do so in a digestible fashion. And his Twitter threads are really becoming legendary. So, Pear, I hope that's not too much pressure for you since you're you know, lauding your skill on Twitter. Uh, yeah, no pressure at all. <laughs> How did you get into Twitter anyway? I mean, is that, is that something you just fell into, never really intended to build an audience? Yeah, I didn't really. I mean, uh, I signed up for the handle on Twitter a long time ago because... My previous career, I was in in computers and systems development and things like that. So I, I, I knew early on that if there was something new coming and it might become big, I wanted my name. Yeah. And I didn't want someone else to take it. So I, I had it for a long time, but I don't think I tweeted for many years. And mm-hmm. I never really understood it. I mean, why the heck would people limit themselves to 140 characters as well back then? And it was, I mean, you know, it's high pitched. Um, Really, really nasty comments, and of course, there's no nuance or anything like that. And and I mean, it's basically the the worst of mankind <laughs> that's on Twitter. Uh, so I couldn't even follow other people much. But then I found sort of some people who seemed reasonable and had different perspectives on things. I mean, very political still. Um, but I mean, some progressives, some conservatives, and a bunch of libertarians, of course. Uh, and I started following them. It was sort of interesting. And I started commenting on them. And, and then eventually it just happened that I saw others doing tweet storms. I think uh, Mark Andreessen called them. I think he was sort of the inventor of 
of this concept, writing a number of tweets following each other, just responding to the tweets over and over again to make it into the story. And I tried that and people just liked it. And I just get back to it every time. Basically, every time I read something that pisses me off, which would be every five minutes or so, right? Uh, I have something to write on Twitter. <laughs> and very often it's pretty basic Austrian points about value subjectivity or what an economic good actually is and things like that. And it becomes a, a thread, maybe 30 tweets or something like that. And I just explain what it is and why it matters and, and connect it with some of the issues that people are are talking about at that time and 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 that's basically it but apparently there there's an audience for this sort of thing so i have organically grown a following of almost 10,000 people now well don't feel guilty about the time you're spending on twitter because your tweets are actually substantive and they actually help people learn things <laughs> as opposed to most twitterers but you know i was thinking before we came on air here i wanted to ask you how and and when did you first hear about and read Human Action? I'm curious about that. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I have no idea when I heard about it. I don't know that at all. I um, mean, I've read excerpts, and I think a lot of people have for a very long time. And I, I know the first time I actually held Human Action in my hand was when I bought a very expensive copy in, in leather and everything like that for my then girlfriend, now wife. Uh, so I ordered it from here, from, from the US, I think from the Fair Books or something like that, uh, to have it shipped to Sweden uh, for her birthday or something like that. I think that's the first time I actually held it in my hands. But the first time I read it uh, cover to cover was I think for Rothbard Graduate Seminar. Okay. And, and for those who don't know, that's a week-long seminar we hold here at the Mises Institute, and it usually covers one book, one lengthy book in full. So, Per, that said, uh, part three. Now, as I mentioned, we've been through the first two parts with some other guests. And uh, for those who are following along, part three is really short. And it's an easy read of about uh, 30 odd pages. It consists of chapters 11, 12, and 13 in the book. The entire part is called Economic Calculation. And Per, he gets into the beginning of this part, sort of where he left off at the end of part two, talking about how important money prices and calculation have been, and that really the the ability to assign numbers to things, and as a result of that, calculate is, in for Mises, a, a substantial human achievement. It's not just bookkeeping. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean... It, he starts out by talking about how we prefer between different things and we can choose between different things because we value them differently. But going from there to an advanced economy with production and in different stages and very specific kinds of tools and everything like that, you just preferring is, is not enough anymore. You, you can't really get anywhere unless you have a common denominator so that you can compare. Uh, and he goes into that just simply choosing between to, um, I think it's two plays or something like that on the very first page, that's not a big deal because you're doing it for yourself and, and you sort of have a feeling for which play you would rather see at a certain moment. And, and then maybe the next moment is different, but that doesn't really matter. But, but choosing between those things is, is not a big issue. But the problem becomes, of course, when everybody specializes in producing different things and you meant different and different options and you have delays as well, where where you supply the economy with some good or service that others have find value in, and you get uh, a get purchasing power back from them, and that you then can invest in something and maybe save a fraction of it and so forth, and then it becomes really really uh, messy and well, it's actually impossible with, without a a money and a, a single unit. Right, and he talks about pre-money societies, in other words, with barter, which is awful and makes everybody poor uh, because of the lack of coincidence of wants, double coincidence of wants. But in barter, you see the inputs and outputs. You say, hey, do I want to trade my uh, my chicken for some of this guy's wheat? And so uh, what what money the money process allows us to do, monetary calculation allows us to better understand the inputs and outputs when things are are more complex and we're not in a barter system. Exactly. And and in the barter system, you can really only do very 
simple things. I mean, you can you can imagine if in a small society where you have someone is as good at picking strawberries and doing that, and someone is maybe fishing and whatnot else, and then you have someone who wants to uh, build boats. Well, I mean, how do you build a boat and sell it to to someone who is who has a bunch of fish or something like that? And and how many fish exactly for that boat? You don't want all that many fish because you can't really store the fish, and you can't really also buy a part of a boat for one one fish or two parts of a boat for two fish and so forth. So you can't really produce these big things and big capital is not really possible unless you have some kind of unit and, and uh, medium of exchange. And of course, he gets into value heavily in this chapter. And so he's talking about value goes to ends, but as actors, we have to look at means to, to uh, obtain value and whether we prefer A to B. And he has some criticisms for what he calls the elementary theory of value and prices. So for, first of all, I guess we need to impress upon our listeners that Mises insists there's no unit of value. Money's not a unit of value. It's a, it's a va- value is subjective and it's imbued upon things by the, the actor, by the individual. So he's got some criticisms for not just the socialists, but also the neoclassicals who who didn't really understand value except in terms of inputs or the or labor theory of value, how much time and effort went into something, how much cost went into something, the materials that went into something. And because these conceptions of value were wrong, they don't fully understand how to rebuke socialism, for example. Yeah, exactly. So value is simply put, is just, just the satisfaction you get out, out of consuming or using something. That's it. And from from that uh point of view, then you would use a certain means only if you think that it will lead to a value that that is greater than having that means itself. And you'd only choose the greater value that you can get from it. Whereas whereas, uh, most of the other schools and the older schools, and well, except for the Marxists who are still, who still believe in this stuff, they start with the cost and the value is sort of result of the cost. Whereas for Austrians and Mises, the point is the value. I mean, you start with the end product, that is what is valued, and whatever is used to produce that that end product has value in use simply because the end product is expected to have value and to thereby uh, bring us some satisfaction. So he has this great quote here at page 204, for those of you who have the scholar's edition, where he says, an inveterate fallacy asserted that things and services exchanged are of equal value. And this goes back to his earlier chapters on acting man. He says, look, if if we're just the same after an exchange, we wouldn't be bothered to engage in it. And this is what even neoclassicals or, or classical economists in his era have failed to understand is that people don't do these things to come out equal. They do these things because they have preferences and they think they're better off. That's why exchange happens in the first place. Exactly. And and this is something that already Menger was talking about in Bombardico, so uh, – copying his example too, talking about how how uh, there's really no reason to exchange unless you think you're going to get better off from it. And I remember Bing- Menger is talking about, he's really attacking Adam Smith, They're talking about do we actually have a propensity to truck barter and exchange, as, as uh, Smith puts it. And Menger says, well, if that is the case, then we would see two neighboring farmers meet up um, and just exchange barley for barley. And they would just exchange for fun because they have a propensity to truck barter and exchange. And it says, no, that's ridiculous. That's that's not the case. We exchange because we want something and we want that something more than what we give up. And the other person is exactly the other way. They want what we're offering in exchange for that thing more than what they are giving us. Uh, so it's always for value and for, for becoming better off, which really means that we, we sort of escape some felt uneasiness, as Mises would put it. But, you know, Dr. Bieland, there's always these people who are sort of suspicious when we say that both parties think they're better off after an exchange. You you know what I mean. There are people who criticize uh, certainly free market economics, but economics as a whole, as a discipline, saying, no, 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 Jeff, you're being facile. People have to eat. They have to have shelter over their heads. So these exchanges are not really what Mises makes them to be. Of course, uh, yes, sure, they, they pay their money in order to have, let's say, rent an apartment because they think they're better off, but that's not really a voluntary exchange. I mean, I'm just throwing this out there because 
I, I think what Mises is getting at here is almost a pre-political argument. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's praxeology, so it really comes from action. We choose to uh, act in a certain way because of something, and action is always directed towards getting some kind of value on our own terms. I mean, and from our own position and whatever it is that we see in that situation, it could be that we have, as, as these critics would put it, no choice, meaning basically that one option is so much better than all the other options. So we don't consider it a choice even. We just automatically go for it, right? But it's still because we have to act and make the choice to act, it, it it has to be for something that we value more than the options, or we wouldn't do it. Right. And of course, one thing Mises really drives home here is that how important a, a, a new technology at the time was called money prices. The ability to compare inputs and outputs on some sort of common basis is really something you and I, you know, we get up in the morning, we take that for granted. But we shouldn't take it for granted. And people who have, God help them, who have lived through hyperinflationary uh, episodes in life, and these days that's mostly older people, unless maybe you're in Argentina or Zimbabwe, um, you know, this is the, the ability to, com- to, to compare inputs and outputs on this common basis of a, of a money it is actually a huge, m- marks a huge advancement in human civilization. Yeah, and potentially the the most important one, I mean, not just a, an important one, but the most important one, maybe more important than the wheel, who knows, it's simply because you can compare and contrast, you can figure out how to move ahead, and you can produce for others, which of course releases uh, produ- productive powers of everybody quite a bit, because that means that I can I can focus on producing what I am good at producing, whether or not I I want the outcome. I can use the outcome and sell it in order to get the purchasing power so that I can buy something that I want instead. So even my production, my activities are sort of indirectly for my own uh, benefit. And that's that's simply impossible without a money. Right. And money, of course, is a way for us to hopefully obtain things we want without having to barter. And, and part of what obtaining things we want means is that we're going to obtain them in the future. And that's really what chapter 12 is all about. It's called the sphere of economic calculation. And this is one of those little chapters, hidden little chapters in this book that to me has some delicious examples of Mises's philosopher hat coming on. There, there are some, I'll get to it in a second here, but there are some parts of this chapter that are almost Eastern <laughs> in, in orientation. So he starts out by saying, look, you know, uh, historians talk about prices in the past, what things used to cost, but really, what, you know, money facilitates anticipating the future. And, and that's why it's scary, uh, even what's happening right now in our own country with the Fed uh, with the you know on the monetary side, but also with the Treasury and the Trump administration on the fiscal side, talking about maybe sending everybody a check for two thousand dollars or whatever it might be, is that uh, we've become accustomed to sort of anticipating at least somewhat what our dollars can get us in the future. And if that changed rad- radically or rapidly, that that makes things more difficult for us. Yeah, it does. Uh, but that's also a, I mean. In- uh, it's a fallacy to think that prices are stable or that price, prices will always uh, change slowly and so forth. And he goes through this too in, in this in this part of the book, uh, that prices are always fluctuating and they're always changing. So if, even though we do have a common denominator, everything is in a sense speculation. I mean, you can learn from history in our own experiences of the purchasing power of the dollar or whatnot. Um, but the fact is that as soon as we act, all the costs and all the prices will be future prices. We don't, just because it was a certain price yesterday doesn't mean that it will be the same tomorrow. And of course, if someone starts meddling with the currency itself, uh, as you referred to, then we're totally screwed because then there's really no, no reason for assuming some kind of path dependency in terms of purchasing power. Um, and I mean, we've really experienced this Maybe not at this scale, but for a very long time. Um, I mean, everybody everybody knows that prices go up over time. Uh, we all have that experience. And I bring this up to my my students, asking them, okay, so w- what is the natural um, uh, the natural uh, development or evolution of prices? And they all say that prices go up. That's what what they do. Everybody knows that. 
And then I asked them, okay, but why do they go up? Is it because of of competition because businesses are trying to beat each other and produce much more productively or is it because of innovation that they produce something in a better way or some something new more valuable or, or what is it that makes uh, all these products go up in price and they look at each other and look at me very confused thinking well, well this doesn't make any sense if if this is how the market actually works then shouldn't prices actually fall and yeah they should fall mm -hmm. i mean prices should always fall because of competition, because that's how the market works. But since someone is meddling with the actual uh, currency, the common denominator, prices go somewhere else. And of course, that's the experience we have. So we're going to think automatically that that's probably going to happen in the future too. And of course, as Mises points out, a money price is nothing but an exchange ratio. And falling prices are, of course, a good thing for consumers. So this exchange ratio is not fixed. And that's really the whole point of this part of the book is that calculation deals with change and change is inherent in human society. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, when he goes into the businessman, what the businessman does, uh, and of course, the businessman in one way or the other produces for other people so that he can get a profit, hopefully. I mean, both the costs and the, the revenue, both are future prices. So, I mean, this poor guy is speculating like crazy um, on both sides. So, but had he had, had he not had a common denominator for both sides, there is no way he could compare those. He could not figure out whether he would, this would be potentially a profitable uh, enterprise or if it would just cause him a loss or, or what to expect at all. Yes, and as but as you mentioned, he goes into it in a whole subchapter here, a, a discussion of stabilization, this sort of fetish that economists and so-called policymakers have to for stability. And he says, well, no, 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 no. Any this stabilization is a contradiction, and it leads to all kinds of errors when we try to stabilize prices. Yeah, he does, and, and you can sort of understand stabilization because if you want to produce a plan for society or a plan for the economy. It really sucks uh, to have to update that plan all the time. Uh, and then if everything changes, then oh, that sucks. I mean, when I teach entrepreneurship and the way entrepreneurship has traditionally been taught, you start with an idea and then you put together a business plan and you put all these numbers and all this text and produce this 100 page long document. And then you go to the banker and you get a loan and then you start the, your business basically. But then of course, the real world is not how you planned it. It never is. So you, this business plan is supposed to be a living document. So you're supposed to update it all the time. Well, that really sucks. Who wants to write a hundred page document with numbers and, and budgets and all this stuff when you have to update the freaking thing every day? Yeah. You don't want to. And and some things you simply can't uh, do if, if the plan doesn't hold unless you plan for a long time. So from the point of view of of politicians and the rulers of society, uh, they want to stabilize everything and fix everything. And, that's, and they want one big company producing this this type of item and another big company producing this other item. And you want not a lot of people trying to get uh, jobs and negotiate for, wa for wages. It's probably better to have one national union to set wages for everyone at once, because then you can plan ahead nicely and have a smooth curve and, and all this stuff. So for, from the point of view of planners, especially if you have plans for a large chunk of society, then you, you want stabilization. Of course, there, there is, that's, a, that's an illusion, but if, if you can somehow uh, force uh, stabilization or, or a static, non-changing society, that would make it easier to plan. Yeah, what's so interesting here is it's the progressives who are actually the st static, right? It's the progressives who don't want change, who were, at least in his era, pushing all the stabilization. There's this great uh, paragraph on page 224 where it says, you know, human action originates change, and it's beyond the power of man to stop it and to bring about an age of stability in which all history comes to a standstill. And when I read that again the other day, it was interesting to me. I, I, Pear, I almost thought that there was something Eastern or Zen about this, this idea that we have to make friends with impermanence. Doesn't sound like a, it doesn't sound like a hard-headed Western capitalist. It's, it's the kind of writing that you find all throughout human action, which is, which is surprising, for one. It's also engaging, but it's so unlike an econ textbook. Oh, sure. But I mean, the fact that you have 
uh, words and sentences is also different from any <laughs> textbook. So, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's very different. I mean, the, the, the more you dig into Austrian writings, uh, maybe not all of it, but most of it, and human action as well, you, you realize that everything is sort of, in a sense, very stringent in terms of the logic and, and very clear, but also very fuzzy because we're talking and, and dealing with uh, people and the the core component is subjective value. And we can't say anything about how people value things or what they value. We just know that they do. And then they act on it somehow. And that causes all these structures. And we can say something about the structure through praxeology, but I mean, exactly what people choose and, and how and all this stuff, we really don't know anything about it. And we don't need to know it either for, for economics. It's just modern economics pretending to be both statisticians and psychologists um, who want to be able to put everything in, in math equations and so forth. They do that stuff. But, but I mean, there's nothing, no, no other tech, types of text in economics that I've seen who where the theorists actually treat people as humans, which is definitely the case with Austrians. What's interesting, maybe a little perplexing and, and unnerving, is that if you read Mises, if you read Praxeology, heck, if you read Hayek, uh, The Use of Knowledge in Society, there's a, there's a huge amount of humility there. The idea that we can't know everything, we can't plan everything, we can't structure everything. And yet sometimes all of us as, as economists or fans of the Austrian school, as lay people, we, we, we can sometimes be a little strident and know it all that we're right about everything. But it's precisely because we're not necessarily right about everything or know everything that we promote the kind of libertarian policies that we do in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> since you can't know, then you can't also can't plan and you can't decide for others. So the only option that could possibly work is to let people make their own choices. And of course, the the more choices are being made and the more different choices are being made, the more we're going to realize what actually worked out and which way was a better way and we can observe others. So, I mean, there, there's a whole learning process going on throughout sort of society's progression. Um, and I mean, th there's only one way to make this happen and, and to benefit from this, and that's to let people free. Let me give the readers or the listeners another example of his prose here on page 227. There are in this world no such things as stability and security, and no human endeavors are powerful enough to bring them about. There is in the social system of the market society no other means of acquiring wealth and of preserving it than successful service to consumers. Now, that's, uh, that's music to my ears. And I have to say, before we exit this chapter... Uh, it, as an aside, he does manage to get in a little dig at Irving Fisher, who uh, probably many of you have heard of as one of the preeminent mathematical economists. He was born just about a generation before Mises, but uh, I was digging around about him over the weekend, and right before the 29 crash, 1929 crash, Irving Fisher actually sounded a little bit like Donald Trump saying, oh, you know, this is the greatest economy ever, and the stock market's in really good shape, and it's just going to go up, up, and up. And so, of course, Fisher is responsible for giving us, at least in part, he's, he's credited with creating uh, M times V equals P times T. And so he was not only mathematical, but he was someone who was really behind some of these legislative efforts to create stabilization of the U.S. dollar. And uh, I always like it when, when Mises throws in a name or discusses something that's a little more than current pair, because so much of this book, you're, you're reading it, he's writing it in the 1940s, but so much of it is almost ethereal and that it doesn't seem, it seems timeless and not necessarily grounded in his era. Yeah, it is. I mean, some of the examples obviously are, are a little bit dated, uh, but I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the point of a, having a logical uh, deductive science too. To, I mean, that there's nothing in, say, in math or logic or geometry that goes, oh, old style triangles i mean <laughs> triangles are triangles right and it's the same thing with economics the, the way we do it with praxeology that you no know, the logic is there and a human is a human there's there's not, nothing that changes much in in what is the, the human condition so if we just start with uh, people value things subjectively and then from there as as we do uh, in praxeology derive all these these truths about what must be the case in interaction and in action, 
I mean, those are timeless truths. It can be no other way unless man turns into something else. And at that point, we're not going to use economics anyway. Well, I think a lot of our friends in government, that's their job. That's their goal is to turn man into something very different. Uh, let's talk about this final chapter, chapter 13 of, of uh, part three, monetary calculations, tool of action. This is one of those little two or three page chapters that you find throughout the book here and there. It's really interesting because he's talking about praxeology and he says, you know, monetary calculation requires both money as opposed to barter and it requires math, numbers. And to him, this is so important that, you know, not just praxeology, but its subset economics sort of emerged when man started to figure out how to think about how to calculate. Yeah, exactly. Because it's only through calculation that we can produce, like we talked about before, but it's it's also the case that we can start producing very advanced uh, things and through very advanced processes. We can start to discover really how productive we can be through development of capital and very elaborate roundabout production processes and so forth, simply because we can calculate and thereby we can forecast whether something will turn out good or bad and so forth. And, and of course, the Austrians, unlike some of the free market schools that are that are still sort of uh, tangling over the mantle, never fell for the homo economicus argument. And we see a little bit of that from Mises on page 231, where he says, uh, you know, he's, he's basically talking to the left here, I think, to the people who think uh, life ought to be art and beauty and not this hard uh, economic calculating approach to everything. And he says, there are people to whom monetary calculations repulsive. They do not want to be roused from their daydreams by the voice of critical reason. Reality sickens them. <laughs> they long for a realm of unlimited opportunity. And, you know, it's so funny because those lines just remind me that we, we always have had this this call in society to live in some sort of post-scarcity fantasy world. And it existed, you know, 80 years ago. It's going to exist 80 years from now. There's always going to be people who think that we shouldn't have to get up and produce in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, they sort of seem to assume that we're already in a post-scarcity society. And and I, I think part of, of their reasoning starts with thinking simply that scarcity itself was created um, and it's because we have capitalists who sort of occupy land that we don't have enough land. And it's because capitalists occupy factories uh, that we don't have enough work for people, and enough income. And it's because capitalists produce food and therefore have monopolized food production that we don't have enough food and so forth. But I mean, I don't think you can find anything even close to uh, confirming that view if you look at any of the data in terms of how much more food we're producing and how much less resources we're using in this production and how prices of all these resources and, and these goods are falling over time. Uh, and what's happened over the past two or three hundred years through industrialization and adopting more of markets uh, and more of trade. I mean, it's it's just ridiculous to claim that there is any type of scarcity because some people are occupying the resources. I mean, th then this being said, I'm not saying that no one is occupying resources. I mean, you mentioned the state before, and what do they do except for occupying resources and making us less productive? But still, I mean, we're producing so much more in terms of goods and services to satisfy uh, people's wants at much lower prices than ever before. So claiming uh, that this is some kind of cold and hard and brutish uh, society where we're all enslaved because of money. Uh, I mean, money is, it's, as he Mises talks about in these three chapters and elsewhere, money releases the productive powers of people and releases, in, in a sense, the innovativeness of people too. So we can have people innovate new types of products, new ways of producing things and new types of materials and all these things that we then benefit from. Well, Per, I'll leave you with this. I know that in some of your courses at Oklahoma State, you assign Mises and other Austrians. Do you assign portions of this book in any of those? And how do your students respond? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I teach a course in Austrian economics uh, and also have a PhD seminar on value creation in society where I have a bunch of this stuff. And I, I, I assign Menger and von Bavark and Mises and Rothbard and some Lachman and stuff 
like that too. Um, I had them read uh, at least this 1920 essay uh, and, and some excerpts from Human Action as well. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, it's. Um, I think they're a little bit confused at first, simply because they've never seen anything like this. Uh, whether they're e- economics uh, majors or entrepreneurship students or from some other discipline, it doesn't really matter. They've never seen any, any this type of logical reasoning. And, and you can tell sometimes um, my favorite lecture when teaching um, Austrian economics is when we basically go through the paradox of savings, uh, Hayek's essay, even though I don't have them read necessarily that essay, just going through how consuming less means we get growth and more jobs and more investment, more entrepreneurship, and we get wealthier. And you can see how they follow along in the logic and they find nothing wrong in the logic. And that's super frustrating because they know that spending is what makes the world go round, right? But they can't poke hole at it. And you can tell that all of them really want to. So it's 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 a fun exercise as, a, as an instructor to, to assign this sort of thing because since the logic is so obvious and it's so easy to follow, it's it's so compelling the argument, yet everything you've been taught is very different. So how can this be true? Right. That's so interesting that they've always been taught that spending and consumption is the key to economic growth. But they all know as individuals, if they overspend or overconsume, that bad things happen to them. <laughs> and they might find that out with respect to their student debt. Let's hope they don't. Uh, all that said, Dr. Per Bielund, I want to thank you. I want everybody to follow him at Per Bielund, P-E-R-B-Y-L-U-N-D, on Twitter. We've been promoting the book. A lot of you have been taking up the cause and reading it, following along. Uh, it, we'll link to our bookstore version of this, also our free HTML version. You can simply follow along online. There's no need to purchase the book if you don't want to. Uh, the code from the podcast, H-A-P-O-D for Human Action Podcast, that's H-A-P-O-D, gets you a discount in the bookstore, both on the hardcover Scholar's Edition, which is really well worth your while. It's a beautiful book. You're going to enjoy owning it as opposed to just having it on your Kindle or whatever. This is one of those books that you need to, to I think, physically own. Uh, but we also, we've also got a great paperback that's just a few bucks. I think it's $5 or something with a little tiny print for you young people. And uh, this is a journey. You know, it's a book that going through it is going to make you better off. It's not always going to be the easiest thing. I think we joked with Sean Rittenauer that sometimes it's like going to the gym or eating your broccoli or whatever. But nonetheless, uh, you know, Mises is someone who still has to be grappled with. And when Dr. Bieland talks about having students presumably in their early, mid, or even late 20s in his undergraduate and then PhD programs at Oklahoma State who have never come across Mises or Hayek, well, that's an indictment of us uh, that we have as a society and as an Austrian movement sort of allowed this state of affairs to exist. And so it, it's, it's incumbent upon us to have people reading the Austrian school and promoting it. And they should be reading Marx and Thomas Piketty, too. And if they come to a con- their own conclusions, that's fine. But we need to be out there. We need to be a voice. And we're so grateful and thankful to people like Pear, who do such an excellent job uh, of making this school of thought come alive for people. So that said, Dr. Bielun, thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.